It is 401, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. People are just are still joining us, but I'll just do some of the housekeeping stuff first. My name is Erica Zambello, and I'm the Communications Director for Audubon, Florida. And welcome to this webinar about Audubon, Florida's rooftop nesting program. So Jeff and Rebecca are uh, gonna start us off, but first, everybody is um, muted and there's no video coming into the webinar just because we have so many people. However, we are monitoring both uh, the chat within Zoom and also the comment section on the Facebook Live. So if you have questions um, throughout the presentation, please feel free to put that in the chat box and we will either um, answer it as we're going or we will have a question and answer period at the end. So feel free to, to put whatever questions you have in that chat box. This is being recorded and we will upload it to um, the Audubon Florida education page, which you can get to on the Audubon Florida website, fl.audubon.org. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeff and Rebecca, who both work for our Coastal program. Thank you guys so much for doing this. We're really excited to learn about the unique species that call Florida rooftops home. Thank you, Erica. Um, my name is Rebecca Snyder. I am the rooftop nesting coordinator in the Panhandle. And we're both really excited to talk to you all about our rooftop nesting monitoring program, um, introduce to you rooftop nesting and why it's so important for our coastal program. So Audubon Florida's rooftop nesting monitoring program is a statewide monitoring program. Um, we are joined with several other partners under the FSA, which is the Florida Shorebird Alliance. Um, monitoring rooftops actually began early in the 1990s by the St. Petersburg Audubon Society, but rooftop nesting itself has been documented in Florida as early as the 1950s. So um, part of our objective of, in monitoring rooftops is to protect the birds, uh, primarily the uh, listed uh, seabirds and shorebirds that utilize these rooftops to protect them and their nesting. So before I delve too far into the mechanics of our program itself, I do want to introduce to you some background information that's important to know about rooftop nesting. So this is not just a Florida thing. Um, rooftop nesting does occur all along the Gulf Coast from Texas to Florida as well as along the Atlantic and Pacific coastline. Um, you can see um, this is an excerpt done by Audubon, South Carolina. They did a fabulous piece on a pair of American oyster catchers that were nesting on a rooftop in downtown Charleston. So birds utilize rooftops all over the United States, um, but actually they also do in other parts of the world as well. So this is an article that came out in the late 70s, and it was the first real comprehensive review of rooftop nesters worldwide. And what they found was that 22 species um, actually utilize rooftops um, in this way. Um, a, a majority of them were actually seabird and shorebird species, um, as well as others such as common night hawks and osprey. Um, but it's important to note um, how vast and, and wide uh, rooftop utilization is and how important it is for um, conserving these areas. So the birds that Florida monitors, um, we have a few focal species um, and that is dependent on their state status and how they're listed. So, Primarily, we have least terns nesting on rooftops. So when Jeff and I talk about an active rooftop, what we are typically talking about is an active least tern colony. Um, they make up the real bulk of active rooftops in our state, but you may also find um, American oyster catchers, um, black skimmers. They too are listed in our state as state threatened. But in addition to those, you could also find gallbill terns in a colony, um, as well as killed deer. Um, killed deer like to nest, you know, in lots of, lots of funny places, but um, they may be intermixed with a colony um, or actually just claimed a whole rooftop on their own. Um, and so we do have some state threatened species, um, as well as others who are of least concern, like the killed deer, but then we do have 
federally listed species such as the roseate tern that utilizes rooftops down in the Florida Keys. So rooftops are a very significant um, to all of these different bird species that we focus on. So as I had mentioned, um, least terns do make up a bulk of our rooftop nesting activity. We wanted to show you exactly what we mean in comparing active rooftops to ground nesting activities. Um, and as you can see, it's very, very widespread. Uh, the circles here are the areas that Jeff and I both oversee. So I'm in the Northwest Panhandle and he's down on the West Coast near the um, near Tampa Bay, St. Pete. And um, all of these uh, dots, these light green dots that you see um, are all of the rooftops that are considered suitable. So when we talk about a suitable rooftop, what we're really saying is uh, a flat gravel rooftop that has been utilized um, by a seabird or shorebird species at some point um, in existence that we know of. And so there are, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, in the state of Florida, over 300 rooftops. Um, but the rooftops that Jeff and I, uh, that we uh, oversee are about 130. So within these two circles, 130 of those rooftops um, are what Audubon covers. And we do this um, not just by ourselves, but also with um, a, lot of, a lot of help from our volunteers. So um, kind of recapping a bit, we've talked about, um, you know, where birds are nesting on rooftops, what species of birds are nesting on rooftops, and more specifically, what species of Florida are nesting on rooftops but we haven't really gotten into why are these birds nesting on rooftops. So it's important to know that these birds are beach nesting birds. They've been utilizing the coastline um, to rear their chicks and raise their young, and they've been doing this year after year. So the threats to rooftop nesting birds are the same threats to beach nesting birds. And the reasons why they are using gravel rooftops is because of the increased pressure in their natural habitat. So development, um, you know, increased uh, urbanization and human disturbance, sea level rise, predation. These are a lot of things that affect their natural environments um, that kind of um, push them out um, and make them have to find other suitable areas to nest in. So one of the questions that I get asked a lot is how do these birds um, think that a rooftop looks like a coastline? Well, um, that's a really good question, but um, if you look at these two photos, you can see that gravel rooftops actually don't look that different in compared to traditional nesting habitat that we have here along the coast of Florida. So on the left, you can see that um, we have a bird nesting and, and loose uh, sandy and shelly uh, substrate, maybe some sparse uh, vegetation, but it's fairly open. And then on the right, we have uh, a gravel rooftop, which looks very, very much the same. And um, the reasons the birds are able to use this rooftop is because of how similar it is. And we call that um, an artificial habitat that mimics natural habitat. So it provides the camouflage to let the chicks and the eggs blend in. Um, it's open, so they have good visuals of predators. Um, it's also large enough to hold a, a good sized colony of birds. Um, but primarily the, the nesting substrate is what's important. These birds make scrapes in the sand of which they lay their eggs. Um, and essentially that's where the, the birds grow up. So rooftops provide an open area for nesting, and I had mentioned that that's really important when supporting, you know, colonial nesting birds. Um, you can have a rooftop that is smaller, um, maybe only a few pairs, two to three, but then we can have some rooftops that range up into the hundreds. It, it really does depend on the rooftop itself. Um, you know, what birds are, are going there, if they're attracted to you, it, it sometimes switches year to year. Um, sometimes we have sites that are consistently large and then sometimes they're just active and then not. It really does depend. Um, but it is important to note that um, the openness of the rooftop and the gravel itself is what makes these rooftops so attractive to these birds. 
So with that said, um, you know, are rooftops a, a good substitute for their natural habitat? And um, there are a lot of pros and cons to this. Um, yes, considering the amount of disturbance that we see in natural habitat, it's entirely advantageous that these birds are able to adapt and find other areas that they can nest in since they're losing their natural habitat. But is it actually better? And um, it, it's very hard to say, and I don't think you really find someone who will ever tell you it's, it's definitely better that a bird is not nesting in its natural habitat. Um, but with that said, um, there are definitely a lot of pros to this. And um, some of them I'd like to go through with you is obviously the decreased human disturbance. So for example, we just had a really great holiday weekend. A lot of people like to go to the beach for it. Um, but because of that, you know, that's where the beach birds are. Um, and so we do have lots of issues come holiday weekends um, with beach goers. Uh, rooftops don't have to deal with everybody going to the rooftop on the 4th of July. Um, we don't have as many mammal predators on rooftops. So every year, you know, we're hearing of coyotes, of raccoons, cats and dogs that are going after our American oyster chicks and predating on least turn eggs or going after skimmers. And that's just not something that we have to deal with um, on rooftops, which is a huge, huge benefit to them. In addition to those things, we also don't have any overwash from storm surge. So for example, crystal walking through, um, a lot of birds had suffered because of that and the storm surge. And luckily Jeff and I did not see the same detrimental effects on our rooftops. And that's because we're elevated and, and on a roof and um, we just don't have those same pressures. However, there are also some cons as there are in, in many situations. And one of the biggest is you know, you're on a rooftop, so now you're elevated. And so when you have a chick um, and there's no protective barrier, that chick can likely fall off the edge of the roof. And that is sometimes you know, a fatal fall. Um, unfortunately, uh, certain heavy rains, depending on the rooftop, can cause um, rooftops to drain very poorly. It's very much dependent on the maintenance and upkeep of the rooftop itself, so it's site specific, but that is sometimes an issue um, that we have seen. Um, there is also the, um, the issue of where foraging areas are. So if you're a beach nesting bird on the coastline and you need to go eat fish, you're relatively close to your food source, whereas if you're on an inland rooftop, you might have a lot farther to go, and that could be a lot more stressful for an adult. Um, in addition to those things, the gravel size itself could also uh, cause harm. Uh, there was a study done on black skimmers several years ago um, that found that larger, more coarse gravel can actually cause breakage to the eggs. And they had suggested that it might be more beneficial if a smaller gravel uh, was used on rooftops. So in trying to answer uh, this question, you know, are these artificial habitats a good substitute? What we would say is we think so. <laughs> um, generally, yes, it is a good thing, but when looking at populations as a whole, we really have to take the, the broad picture and look at this. So I wanted to share um, two examples with you. Um, the first being that over half of Florida's state population of least terns nest on gravel rooftops. So, Currently now the estimate is 55% of all nesting least terns are on rooftops. Roseate terns, as I had mentioned before, are a federally listed species and um, they also are nesting on rooftops. So the real question isn't so much more of is this better for them or is this a good substitute, but rather more what would these birds be doing or how would they be doing if these rooftops weren't here? And this is where we're really getting into the heart of our monitoring program here with Audubon Florida. And like I said before, our primary objective is to protect the birds that are nesting on rooftops and to help them nest successfully. And we do that in a number of ways. Um, one of the most important is protecting the, the nesting area and reducing threats. So if we know of a site where there have been chick falls, we might, you know, help uh, get help from the landowner to install protective barriers. Um, we monitor the sites um, very heavily 
to, to keep an eye on them. So out of all of those 130 sites I had mentioned, Jeff and I make sure that those all get monitored at least once a week, um, which leads me to the next thing. We, we train volunteers because we heavily rely on them for monetary efforts. There's no way we would be able to do it all for the entirety of the season. Um, and also we outreach to the public, rooftop affiliated companies and landowners and managers. Um, we really need the public's support um, to get behind the birds and to help support them in various ways. And then additionally to those things, we try to not only protect them, but also to get an idea of what are the pressures that they're facing on their rooftops. So we implement various techniques such as camera uses or you know, we've tried drones in the past. Um, anything we can do um, to really get a better idea of how these birds are nesting on the rooftop so we can protect them now and in the future. So in monitoring active sites, um, you know, we don't actually just go on rooftops. People ask me, what does a rooftop coordinator do? I don't just go up on rooftops. We, like I said, we want to minimize disturbances. So most of what we do is actually done via ground. Um, so protocol has us do ground surveys for a minimum of 15 minutes. And from that, we gather estimates on populations through what we call flesh counts. And that's when we wait for the 15 minute period for all the birds to fly up. And within that 15 minute window, we count the maximum amount of birds that we've seen. Um, sometimes that's fairly easy if you have, you know, a colony of say six birds. Um, other times you can have 120, 150. How do you know it was not 126? Um, so in those cases, um, it's good to take a camera if you have one, take a, you know, take a shot, um, get back home, count all the birds if you can. Um, you know, we're really looking for, you know, rough estimates to get an idea of what's going on, on the rooftop. Uh, best case scenario is when we have what we call a vantage point to conduct a direct count. So that's an adjacent building um, or something of a higher um, elevation to give us a, a downward look on the rooftop itself. And that way we can look at how many birds are on nest, if there are any chicks, um, you know, if there's still courtship or nest initiation, those types of things. That's really where we get, you know, what we call the good data um, and, and have a, a better idea of how the birds are doing. But in addition to those survey methods and monitoring, we also uh, conduct what we call chick checks. So like I said before, chicks fall. Um, and in those cases, um, you know, the, the best chance of survival is to be returned to a rooftop. So while we're out monitoring, if we know the site's been active and we're likely to have chicks, we do walk around the premise and, you know, make sure that no chicks are fallen. If they are, we safely return them to the rooftop. Um, as I mentioned before, field techniques, uh, camera use is a huge part of our program. Um, it gives us a lot of information that we wouldn't be able to get in that small window of 15 minutes. Um, one of the most important things that we were able to see is predation events. So if we have a camera rolling 24 seven, we're able to see you know, what's coming onto the rooftop at night, if there's an owl, if there's a hawk. So those types of techniques have been really important and better understanding the rooftop nesting dynamic, what pressures they face, and how we can better protect them in the future. So now I'm going to hand this over to Jeff. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so, uh, in addition to uh, monitoring and trying to gather as much data about the birds as we can. Um, we also try to reduce threats as best we can. Uh, so that's really the, the most important part is to, to help those birds uh, be able to, to go through and have a successful nesting season. Uh, Rebecca talked a little bit about how um, human disturbance was a, a threat on the beaches. Well, it, it can be that on um, the on the rooftops as well. Um, 
So we work with property managers to install signs um, like this at roof access points to inform anyone um, that will be going up onto the rooftop um, for any reason that there are nesting birds up there, they're protected, um, just to make sure that there isn't anything that uh, slips through the cracks and, and people get up there and, and disturb the birds. Additionally, Audubon Florida has created a, a manual that we provide to building owners and contractors um, and that educates them about rooftop nesting. Um, it covers how to identify rooftop nesting, you know, what sort of birds you'd be looking for, what behaviors um, would, it, would indicate that, that there are birds nesting on the roof. Um, it talks about the protected status, why these birds are threatened, um, how they can help um, avoid disturbing them. A lot of times um, people think when they're going up onto a rooftop, oh, you know, we won't, we won't bother them, we'll just do our thing, um, we'll leave them alone, we won't step on any eggs. Um, but there's a lot more to it um, than just, uh, you know, not stepping on eggs. If you go up on a rooftop and scare all those birds off their eggs, um, then those eggs are vulnerable to overheating. Um, they basically can cook in the hot Florida sun if you're up there for too long, um, keeping those, those parents from, from tending to the eggs. Um, so in this way, uh, we try to educate the building owners and contractors and by educating the, the contractors about the nesting bird, it, it creates a, a network of people who are regularly accessing different rooftops and they can actually alert us to um, nesting on a rooftop. If they discover a rooftop somewhere that um, we, aren't, we aren't even aware of. Um, so in that way we can uh, help transform the HVAC technicians and, and roof repair um, workers into an asset to the birds rather than a threat. So another threat um, that Rebecca had touched on is uh, chicks falling off the roof. Um, and here's a, a picture of a rooftop where you can see without this um, protective fencing um, there's, there's nothing that's stopping a, a young uh, chick from accidentally uh, falling off the roof. Oftentimes, if there's a, a building like this where the, the edges are unprotected and a predator comes by or somebody does happen to go onto a rooftop, some sort of disturbance like that, um, the chicks will often react to that by fleeing. Um, just running away as um, as they would on a, a beach, but um, they end up actually on the ground um, if they have a rooftop like this. So we work with property owners to um, install fencing like this prior to the nesting season. Uh, so we also cover any open drains that might be a hazard to the chicks and we install chick shelters. Um, that's another habitat modification that we use to try to improve the nesting success of these birds. Um, a lot of rooftops don't offer a lot of shade and uh, providing chick shelters um, that are, are typically just a, a modified pallet. Um, so we just use a, a wooden pallet and weigh it down on the rooftop. Uh, that provides shade to those chicks to help keep them from um, overheating, and it also helps keep them out of sight of the, uh, of any avian predators, uh, you know, an aerial predator flying over like a hawk or a crow. Um, if they just see a, a pallet on the roof um, and, and not little chicks running around, um, that's good. Uh, and the chicks seem to, to really love these shelters and um, they use them quite frequently. So at, if you're at a site where um, it's 
a new site or a site where we haven't been able to install some of this uh, protective fencing. Sometimes we do have chicks that, that fall and when they end up on the ground, um, they're, they're in a, a pretty dangerous setting for uh, a type of bird. So not a good place if you've got um, vehicles and cats, other predators, um, it's, it's really a, uh, not a good place for those birds. So uh, when we do have this issue, we rely on volunteer chick checkers. Um, so we have volunteers that go out to a site regularly to uh, monitor the colony, look for fallen chicks. Um, they can actually be pretty difficult to catch. Um, at, at this point um, in their life, they can't fly, but um, they can run. So. Um, it's sometimes a bit of a challenge to, to corral them all, but uh, if um, you do corral them, you can um, collect them and the best thing for them is to get them back up onto the roof um, where they're reunited with their parents and their parents will be able to keep caring for them. Um, so the issue though is once you have these fallen chicks, you've, you've rescued them how do you get them back up on the rooftop? Um, if you go on the rooftop to let them go, you're liable to scare more birds off. Uh, so the chicks would run away from you trying to help the chicks. Uh, so what we use is something called a chickaboom. And it's a, a, a pretty simple technology, um, but it works really well. So it's, it's basically a a melt carton on the end of a long pole. You put the, the chick in the, the melt carton and then you can sort of walk the, the pole up the, the wall. And then once the carton is over the, the roof, you can gently um, return the chick back to the rooftop. Uh, there are a, a variety of tricks such as um, making a trap door in the in the milk carton or adding a, um, uh, a paint roller on the end of the, the pole to sort of act as a, a wheel as you push it up the, the side of a rooftop. If it's a long, uh, it's a high rooftop um, that's necessary sometimes to be able to, to get the chick back up there. So one of the things that we realized um, in rescuing these chicks is we had a, a rare opportunity to learn more about waste terns. And prior to being returned, um, when we can, we try to outfit the chicks with colored bands that allow us to identify that individual wherever it's seen again in its life. So through this banding, um, we have learned that um, those chicks that we rescue and return to the roof, they do survive. We do see them out on the beaches later on. Um, and now those birds that have been rescued, you know, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, um, that are banded, those are an important part of our breeding population today. Um, so whenever I, I see those, I think um, that, that that chick uh, probably wouldn't have made it if it weren't for um, our dedicated volunteers. Uh, although reciting uh, banded roof turns isn't, isn't the easiest, you have to uh, know what you're looking for on their, their small little legs. Um, we have learned a lot um, through the banding project. One thing we've learned is that one-year-old birds like this will return to their non-breeding grounds in the Caribbean and South America, they'll return to Florida um, at in their in their first summer. So when they're about one year, um, they're not old enough to breed yet. Um, so sometimes we see them actually showing up at, at colonies and hanging around for a while, uh, potentially just prospecting for uh, good nesting sites for the following year. Additionally, we have documented rooftop raised chicks nesting uh, on beaches up and down the Gulf Coast of Florida. 
So we know that when we're protecting and supporting rooftop colonies, uh, we're, we're supporting the broader turn population. Uh, so it's also pretty apparent that if you were raised on a rooftop, you don't necessarily go back and breathe on a rooftop. Uh, so from, from banding lease turns, we're also working on analyzing the data from um, the past number of years and working on determining survival rates, which um, will help us to understand population dynamics and get a better sense of, of what's going on with, uh, with these threatened birds and, and how we can best uh, work to conserve them. So unfortunately, another threat to the least turns is the loss of tar and gravel rooftops. Um, this roofing method was once popular, uh, but is now obsolete. And it's being replaced with ultimate membranes that, that don't have any, any gravel and the substrate is unsuitable. Um, for nesting birds. As these old roofs reach the end of their lifespan, there are fewer and fewer suitable sites. Uh, and uh, that, that makes us ask the question, you know, where, where will these birds go? Um, and there are over half of the, the least terns in the state and a number of other species have come to rely on these rooftops. So it's, it's important that we, we figure out how we can conserve them as these rooftops continue to disappear. So um, Audubon is working with partners to make the beaches more suitable for the birds. Um, but in addition, we're also exploring the creation of artificial nesting habitat. And a great example of this um, was a successful project in Panama City Beach where a historic site that terns had been nesting on had reached the end of its um, lifespan, the, the roof had reached the end of its lifespan, and the owners re-roofed it, but the school wanted to keep um, the least terns there and continue to provide habitat for them. So four uh, gravel nesting boxes were provided to the birds and um, that supported uh, up to 21 pairs of birds uh, returned and, and nested in these um, in these boxes. So it's it's definitely something that we'll have to be looking at more in the future. Uh, and this installing these nesting boxes also gave us a good opportunity to install cameras to observe um, what was going on with the birds at the site and identify any threats such as predators. Audubon has been working with building owners that host nesting birds to maintain their gravel rooftops for as long as possible rather than re-roofing. Um, and we also try to recognize businesses who support um, our work as being bird friendly. Uh, our work in installing fencing and shelters and a lot of the things that we're able to do for the birds relies on the support and cooperation of building owners. So maintaining a, a good relationship with them is important. And Rebecca touched on it, um, but uh, I wanna, wanna say it again, all of this work relies heavily on contributions from our, our volunteers. Uh, they get involved in a variety of, of things and help out with monitoring rooftops, and chick checking, installing fencing, uh, the list goes on. Some of the, the volunteers have been, been at it for uh, 10 plus years. Uh, so we have a really great core of people that um, help to make all of this work possible. So if you're interested in, in learning more, we've got a, a few different links and resources that you can check out here. The first one is, um, the Florida Shorebird Database training video. Um, that would walk you through how we collect data um, of that whole process. Uh, Florida Shorebird Alliance and Audubon Florida also have uh, a lot of good information. Uh, 
on rooftop nesting and leaf pairing. Also, if you want to reach out to us, feel free to contact us. If um, there's, there's any way that we can, can help or um, provide you with information, we are, are very happy to and we'd, we'd love to, to hear from you. Thank you very much. I know there are uh, bound to be some questions, um, so we are happy to stick around and provide some answers for you. Great, thank you guys so much. So there's a bunch of questions and some of them you've touched on a little bit, but because so many people were curious, I figured we could go back. One of them is that Florida is incredibly hot. Those rooftops are incredibly hot. On beaches, chicks are able to dig a little bit in the sand. They're able to potentially um, shadow in vegetation. What do the birds do on rooftops to beat the heat? That, that is a very good question. Um, and being up on those rooftops at times, I can tell you they are very hot. Um, one of the things that the parents will do to um, help cool down the chicks, the least turns will fly to an adjacent body of water. Sometimes it's just a small um, stormwater area or um, if, if it's by the beach, they'll, they'll do it. Um, in the ocean, but they'll actually come down to the water and just wet their breast feathers, just dive really shallowly, and then fly back to their young chick with the, the, the wet breast feathers to um, cool down their chicks. Um, they're also constantly trying to shade those chicks and, and find places for them uh, to get out of the sun. Rebecca, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> this is also uh, why it's important that we install those chick shelters at these sites because um, there isn't, unlike beach areas and natural habitats, you know, substrates or vegetation for them to hide into. We have to provide that for them. Absolutely. So another very common question is, what about increased predation? So what is the difference between the predators that they face on the rooftops versus what they face on the beach? I can, I can give a go at that. It's, it really depends. Um, when you look at least turn predation, um, it's very hard to look at it generally. It varies across the Gulf. It varies across the state. So down in the South, we have issues with burrowing owls on the beach. Um, Sometimes you have issues with great horned owls. We were able to document uh, predation events by great horned owls on our rooftop last year. Um, those are some things that we're still learning. So um, to say how similar they are is still um, you know, to be determined, um, but we are starting to see that some of the threats are similar, depending at least with avian predation. Uh, but not so much with things, you know, with mammals, uh, coyotes, dogs, cats, those types of things. If, if I can add, add a bit here. Um, so some of the, the rooftops are in, um, sited further away from, from the coast, from beaches where least terns would typically nest. So they're coming into contact with, with species like uh, red-tailed hawks that you don't, um, they don't typically forage on the beach, but um, if you're a, a least turn, uh, a, a red-tailed hawk is a, is a big concern and we have had some red-tailed hawk predation at uh, a number of sites that are inland. So um, that definitely is, uh, you know, a, a, a difference that we don't face on the beaches. What about um, crows and vultures? Crows are an issue on the beach, off the beach, um, on the rooftops. Yeah, they, they are incredibly smart and very persistent. And uh, that's a, another artifact of the uh, human changes that we've made to the landscape um, with a lot of the um, trash and, and handouts that um, the crows are able to, to scavenge. Um, their populations have really exploded in numbers. So they're having a, 
even even the um, birds that are nesting on the beach are having a harder time because of those inflated numbers of, of um, voles and crows. What do you use the decoys for? Well, um, decoys are used uh, not just by us, but by a lot of other uh, coastologists. Um, the idea is that um, you are a colonial nesting bird and you're going to go where all of your friends are. So we have little wooden decoys that are the size of the black skimmers or the least turns, depending on which bird we're replicating. And we put them on areas, whether it's the beach or the rooftop to try to encourage nesting there. Um, there, there is some uh, evidence that shows that, um, you know, the birds do recognize them um, as their own and, and tend to go towards the decoys. Actually, another predation question. What does Audubon Florida do to try to mitigate predation? Because um, I know, Jeff, you're quite creative sometimes when you have some carnivorous birds present. Um. Yeah, so we, we do whatever we can to try to um, dissuade predators from the area. Um, we did have one rooftop where there were um, a pair of loggerhead shrikes were actually at the, uh, at the roof and they started um, to, be, to become a, an issue with the, um, with the least turn chicks. And so, um, it was late in the in the breeding season, um, and in order to sort of shift their attention away from the least turns, uh, I was um, providing them with some crickets, um, so they would come and um, get an easy meal of crickets rather than uh, go up onto the rooftop looking for food. So let's say you work at a building or own a building or live in a building that has a gravel rooftop with a nesting colony. What do you do if you have a AC unit that needs repair or replacement? Do you want to give this a go or should I? <laughs> uh, I, I can take it. Um, so one of the things we do is we work with um, residents and, and property managers to try to take care of um, any issues prior to nesting season. A lot of times birds will come back to the same site year after year. So we send them um, information, try to say, hey, if you're, you're thinking your AC might need some repair, isn't quite working, get it done now. Um, if you know an emergency situation happens where, where roof access is required, there are process, um, that you can go through with the state to um, to get up there, but but ultimately, um, you know, we try to do whatever we can to avoid going up there. Um, but if it if it is something where you know human health and, and safety is an, an issue, um, then there are are methods for for doing for getting up there to do the work, you know, in a way that minimizes impact on uh, the nesting birds. So, you know, fast forward to when it's time for the feathered chicks to actually fly off the roof. Do you know how old they generally are when they do that? And how well do they do? You know, do you have chicks trying to fly and not quite doing a good job off a rooftop? I mean, sometimes uh, we have chicks that are flight capable that they don't necessarily fall off the rooftop, but they tried to fledge and didn't quite make it that time around. Um, and so then they are returned. Um, but it's around, I wanna say the third or fourth week uh, after being, once they're fe fully feathered, um, you know, plus or minus a couple of days here, depending. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, as far as, um, seeing fledged birds, that, that's um, a lot harder to find and see um, a chick taking flight than it is to see an adult in the air, unfortunately. Yeah, the, when the chicks are, are learning to fly, they're um, able to fly horizontally. And even if it's a, a site 
that you have a fence up, sometimes you will get some of those chicks just at that age where they're learning about flight, where they can fly over, over the, uh, the fencing and end up on the ground and they can't quite muster the strength to fly back up to the height of the rooftop. Um, so it, it is an, an issue at, at some sites as they're learning to, um, to take flight, um, but those, those birds can, can often be caught and, and put back on the roof as well. There's a question about rewarding and incentivizing building owners for tolerating a colony during the nesting season. However, I believe they're required to because birds are protected. However, if I am wrong about that, please, please let me know. Yeah, no, um, that's where this job gets very interesting because um, these birds are protected by the state. So legally you aren't allowed to harass them or disturb them, but you can't tell um, private landowners that they are not allowed to access their own property. That's, those are two completely different things. Um, so one of the ways that we have, we have tried to, um, to work with, with landowners. Um, this was several years ago, but we had a very large colony here in Bay County um, in Panama City Beach, over 100 birds. And because they are bringing tiny little minnows all of the time, every now and then they drop them. Um, and you can imagine that with a large colony, there's also a lot of bird feces. So we had actually worked with a local car wash company to provide um, guests at that motel uh, with free car washes because it was a concern about the birds. They couldn't get rid of them. Um, we had to allow them to continue nesting there, but that was one of the ways Audubon was able to make it um, uh, more tolerable for them that the birds were there. Yeah, definitely. Jeff, you got off mute. Do you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, so at this point, there aren't real incentives to um, continuing to provide habitat for the um, birds and that's something that I would, I would like to see in the future. Uh, people have, have talked about maybe tax breaks or something like that. Um, right now they're, the funding for something like that um, just isn't there. No. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely a very nuanced, a nuanced issue. Someone asked what the tallest building was that we monitor. I believe we monitor one that's up to five stories tall. Um, do you guys have any tall buildings in your current portfolio? That's not one of my rooftops. <laughs> um, there are some, some high rises that uh, the birds will, will use. Right now I have um, an oyster catcher on a nine story. Um, apartment building. So they will they will um, definitely use those those high buildings without any problem. Unlike me, they are not afraid of heights. It it also varies though. We have some rooftops that are so low that just walking around the building, uh, they, the birds don't like that either. So you don't even have to be on the rooftop. You just have to be mowing the grass and they don't like it. So it really, it really varies with, with them, the height. Sometimes these species are known to nest in construction sites for similar reasons. Do you monitor any construction sites or have you, um, have you had to deal with that in the past? There are um, some least turns nesting on um, open sandy um, sites that are, are scheduled for um, construction. Um, there are people within um, the state agency, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, that um, work with those those property owners. But um, no, we just we just stick to the rooftops. So you mentioned that the parents sometimes go, you know, to the the, the Gulf of the Atlantic or stormwater ponds or or what have you to water on their feathers to cool off their chicks. 
where do the bird, the chicks themselves have to drink water? And if so, where do they get that? They, they get everything from the fish that their parents bring in. Um, or in the case of the, the oyster catchers, the, the oysters. Um, so it's, it's pretty incredible what um, the way these birds are adapted to live in um, marine environments. Um, often there's, there's no source of, of fresh water even on the, the ground. Um, so um, they, they have the, the physiology to be able to um, get everything they need out of their food. They really are impressive. Well, I do not see any new questions um, in the chat. However, if we miss anything, uh, feel free to let us know. For example, you know, if you know of good nesting habitat, but it's not being used, feel free to um, email us, Adela. I see your question. If you have any questions, feel free to email us. We'd be happy to to answer your questions offline, I'm putting in the chat box um, an email address for flconservation at audubon.org. And uh, if there's no further questions, thank you so much, Jeff and Rebecca. And thank you all for, for coming and talking to us about rooftop nesting birds. Thank Thanks, you. Erica. Thank you.